Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> this Happy New Year to you all. This is little Oren, and I'm going to be speaking about Oren towards the end of the message, but I just wanted you to see him. He's two years old, and he had a wonderful thing happen in these last couple weeks. So, Oren, would you say hi to everyone? Hi. And would you say, night-night, I'm going to go take a nap now? <laughs> okay, wave bye-bye to everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, sweetie. Bye. <laughs> well, it is a great year, and um, because it's a new year. This last year that we've been through has uh, really been tumultuous. It's been uh, an, an awfully challenging year for all of us. And we're excited that we have the opportunity now to bring hope into this new year. And there is a lot of hope. When we turn to God's Word, uh, it's amazing uh, what He has. So if you have your Bibles at home, uh, you could get those out. We're really going to be concentrating on Matthew chapter 20. And um, we're going to deal with uh, with one of the parables that Jesus uh, had had shared. And so... Uh, we want that to to be uh, part of what you what you concentrate on. But you know, spiritually, uh, I'm going to challenge myself. I challenge Katie. Channel challenge uh, all of you that, to make this a spiritual year because uh, we live in a very exciting time, a time when we are seeing things that are going on that are just amazing um, biblically, and it's because. Uh, Jesus warned us about these times, and he warned us, of course, about earthquakes and volcanoes and different things. But the thing that's really coming to fruition is the fact that we see chaos all, all over the world. We have um, not just the United States, where we see many things going on that don't really run in um, the blood and of each one of us. But um, and really, we wonder sometimes, you know, what what's going on? You know, God, are you still there? But of course he is. And um, the more that we get off of all the political stuff and look at biblical things, we can be real excited uh, for this next year, because this next year is going to show many things. And let's remember that our God always progresses. You know, he's a God that uh, that restores. He's a God that um, always is talking about 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. So we have a God that is always progressing in, in what he is doing. It doesn't mean the world is progressing, but it does mean that he is always progressing, and he is always uh, standing for good for each one of us. And so... Um, you know, when we do things for God's sake uh, and Jesus' sake, whether it be our money, whether it be our time, whether it be um, our efforts, uh, as long as we do those uh, for Jesus' sake, we're going to have uh, our blessings multiplied. Because that's part, that's part of the promise of the 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. So um, let's keep in mind that our focus this next year ought to be on on Jesus. It ought to be on the Word of God that has told us about these times that we are now more clearly able to see. And we see them because we have spiritual eyes. And with those spiritual eyes, it gives us an opportunity to not be saddened by the events that we see, but actually be encouraged. So let's intensify our focus on the spiritual truths that are in His Word, um, always remembering that the kingdom of God isn't somewhere out there. The kingdom of God is inside of each one of us. It's inside of me and it's inside of you. And so the kingdom of God um, is the word of God that we put inside of each one of us. Okay. And once we do, and once we search his word, uh, there is nothing hidden, nothing hidden about these times. So we still are, are in for uh, an interesting start of the year uh, politically, but uh, spiritually, we're totally uh, sound in what it is that God has, has taught us, what he showed us, 
and what he promises in our word. Um, so I want this next year to be a year of hope for each one of us. And there is great hope uh, for what is coming. If as long as we look at this world from a spiritual perspective and with spiritual eyes, we actually have an opportunity to become excited about what's happening, not necessarily being drawn down based on those things that, that are going on, especially in politics and especially across the world. So um, we want to be comforted in his plans, and he has some big plans. In um, 1 Corinthians, starting in chapter 9, verse 24, all the way to 27, he, um, he tells us in that word that we're not to be punching at the air. We punch at the air and not hit anything and not understand anything because we're not allowing ourselves to be grounded in what his big plan is. And his big plan does include the fact that we are going to be raptured out of here and there's going to be a tribulation that's going to come that is going to be like nothing else that ever happened. But thank God in his word that, uh, that we're told that, uh, that we won't be here. And, um, and it's clear in his word. If we search his word, we know that, um, that he's, uh, he's got a plan for those that have put their trust in his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. So let me just read um, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. It says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And he goes on in verse 25 and says, And anyone who competes for a prize is temporal in all things. Now, they do not obtain a perishable crown. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into submission, lest when I have preached to others, I myself might become disqualified. And he talks about, again, beating the air, you know, like a boxer or something else, just beating the air, never landing a punch, never being able to be effective, because, um, first of all, we don't see what God's big plan is, and his big plan does include the fact that, uh, that we're covered all the time in all that we do. And so we, we don't have to worry about going after a, a prize that uh, will just perish away and a lot of the prizes here on earth, but we're after a prize that's much greater than that. And that's an imperishable one, the one where we follow the promises of God and understand what it is that he has for each one of us. Um, one of the great hopes that we have is really found in Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. And I'm not going to read that, except I am going to just kind of paraphrase it for you. Um, in that, God is real clear when he talks about the Holy Spirit, which in this scripture he calls the restrainer. And the restrainer is important because for each one of us, who has that restrainer living inside of us, that Holy Spirit that's living inside us, uh, we're aware of the fact that until that restrainer is taken out of the world, okay, the, um, the lawless one will not come in. So the Antichrist is not going to come in and take over until the restrainer is released from this world, which means that every believer who has the Holy Spirit living inside of them will need to, need to be lifted up out of this world before the Antichrist can come. And so the great hope that we have as we live this year and as many years as we live, okay, until he comes back, is the fact that, um, that he is going to take us out of this world. There's going to be seven years of horrible tribulation, but you and I will not be part of that. 
because the only way in this scripture that God tells us that the Antichrist and um, and the uh, lawless one will come uh, into power is only when he releases uh, the restrainer, okay, and takes the restrainer out of this world. This restrainer being the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit living in each one of us. So we're going to be taken out of this world, and then the uh, the lawless one will uh, will come and deceive the people, and they'll think he's the answer. But uh, we'll be looking from up above down on all of that happening, and so that is a great uh, that is a great um, uh, encouragement for each one of us, and it also um, is oftentimes called the rapture, and um, my next message is going to be over the rapture, and, um, and just the hope that we have in the fact that that Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is right now the only thing that keeps this world under control, but when God releases that restrainer out of this world, which means you and me, that's when chaos is going to really hit the fan. So we start to see it now. Um, we're told in that scripture that we're going to see these things start to happen, but uh, the full uh, manifestation of all of that will not happen until we're out of here. So today's message, um, really, I kind of entitled it, um, let's make a deal, dot, 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 not. We never make deals with God. I've made the mistake, uh, maybe sometimes innocently, making deals, you know, God, if you do this, I'll do that. Uh, and, um, you know, and some people have said, boy, if, if you only give me a baby, then all I will do this. If you only give me this, this, I'll do that. Uh, we are gonna see in uh, this parable that we're going to going to look at today that um, we got to be real careful about trying to make bargains uh, with God. And it's a, it's a great parable because it has so many things that are in it. And uh, it's a parable of, of the workers in the vineyard. And um, the parable doesn't apply to the world. It applies to those that have ears to hear. Uh, God always put together uh, parables and parables were really natural stories about supernatural truths. And let's not forget that, okay? It's natural stories that have supernatural truths, which means that they weren't put there so everybody would understand it. Their parables are put there for those who wanna go deeper to have an understanding of what it is that God is trying to tell us. And, you might be bound up by some fears, but let's always remember that the truth, uh, you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. The real key there is knowing the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's not just the truth that sets you free, but you have to know it, and we have to know these truths of what it is that God is doing in our lives, and uh, what he has already mentioned in his word that is true about us. So my desire is that each one of you would uh, would love to go deeper uh, because this parable shows us how good and great God is um, because of uh, his illustration within, within this parable. So I'm going to pick up uh, my Bible and I'm going to pick up my glasses and we're going to read through this step by step. Once again, this is in Matthew 20. Um, and this is the, uh, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So let me start by reading it, and then we'll, we'll break it down a little bit. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers in the vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. That verse 2 there has a lot to tell us. Because verse 2, it says when he agreed with the laborers. In other words, the laborers came to him for whatever reason, 
whether it had been the fact that they might have been burned in the past or whatever, but they came and they said uh, to the landowner, landowner, we're going to work for you, but we want a denarius. And he agreed with them. Oftentimes, it's all about the laborers agreeing with the boss. But in this case, the boss, okay, agreed with the laborers. He said, sure. Um, you go on out and work. A denarius was, uh, in Jesus' time, a denarius was considered to be a full day's work. And so um, that's, what they're, that's what they contracted um, the landowner with, is the fact that they made a contract that if you will pay us a denarius, we will go and work in your vineyard, okay? And that was early in the morning when they were hired. And so... Um, you know, it was a contract, and in some respects, it was a bargain. Uh, they were bargaining. You do this, we'll do this, okay, but you have to pay us that. Do you agree? And the landowner says, yes, I agree. I agree. That'll be fine. So we move on to verse 3. And he went out about the third hour and saw another standing idle in the marketplace. There were others that were standing idle in the marketplace at three, and this was considered um, to be the third hour is nine o'clock in the morning. So at nine o'clock in the morning, look what he says to these people. There is no um, agreement here. He just says, um, and he said to them in verse four, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Was there a contract? The question is, was there a contract there? No. The only, the only thing that was agreed on is the word of the landowner. Whatever is right, I will pay you. And, that's, and so they said, fine. So it's a little different than that first group who decided that if we're going to work for you, we're going to work for you for what we say. And uh, with these people, and it's even the next couple groups, as we'll see, they um, they just took his word for it. Whatever is fair, okay. Whatever is right, I will I will give you. And so they went. And then again in verse five it says again he went out about the sixth hour, and the sixth hour would have been about noon. And then he went on the ninth hour, which would have been three, and did likewise. No contract there, okay. Um, just based on his word. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. Once again, whatever is right. Now, the 11th hour, you know, if the if the ninth hour was uh, three o'clock, then the 11th hour was five o'clock, which means they had one hour left in the day uh, to work in the vineyard. And um, so we get the picture of the different workers and different laborers that went out to the, to the vineyard to work uh, for the landowner. And then we move into, um, into the next verse and verse eight. So when the evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to the servant, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, so that means that those that, those that came at the 11th hour with one hour left and one hour of work, that those people received a full day's wage at 11 o'clock, okay, at the 11th hour. And so um, you can only imagine, okay, um, with an evil heart and an evil eye, okay, we're going to have a little bit of conflict here. <laughs> and when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the, the burden of the heat of the day. 
But the landowner answered and said, But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this man, last man the same as you. And then at verse 15 goes on and asks, Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your evil eye or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. So we have, um, you know, on the surface again, we have a nice natural story. But this has supernatural truths within it that we want to make sure that we grab hold of. And um, so I think it's natural that the last, the people that, that worked all day would have a little bit of complaint in their heart on a nat from a natural perspective because they worked all day and the and the, uh, the the laborers that came in for that last hour ended up getting the same amount they got a denarius a full day's wage just like the people that had worked all day and so um, you know but was the landowner doing them wrong you know and this is part of the message that we need to hear from this parable that um, let's see the first group bargained with the landowner and in his bargaining they said we'll do this if you'll pay us this and the landowner agreed and then for the rest of the day the rest of the workers had no bargaining um, they didn't bargain with the landowner they just went out and the landowner said whatever is right I will I will give you and so by the end of the day he decided that uh, what was right was to give all of them the same amount and um, and of course because their heart and their eye was evil okay that first group of course complained and um, was very upset over the fact that they had to work through the heat of the day for 12 hours and they ended up getting the same thing that one the people in one hour so um, you know when we get to verse 16 and it says so the last is first and the first is last many are called but few are chosen the spiritual truth behind this is the fact that um, that we're all called to his blessings and uh, and to enjoy the blessed life the totally blessed life that he wants to give to each one of us and and it's not it's not for us to say but I did this a little bit more than somebody else okay it's up to the Lord to decide that our life is going to be blessed because you know as we're going to see in a few minutes there is a huge piece of this because the laborers really do represent Israel which I'm going to talk about in just a, a, a little while. And the, um, you know, those, those uh, latter non-contracted laborers, okay, um, really represent the Gentiles. And so we'll see how all that plays together. Um, the question is, did God shortchange the first group? And the answer, of course, is no. He gave them exactly what they asked for. He gave them exactly what they had bargained for and uh, and there was a contract um, and so many times we get ourselves caught into this you show me this and I'll do that we find we find that with our relationships but the problem is sometimes we find that in our relationship with the Lord um, you know the last group went with his word so if you think about it those last groups, not the first one, but the last groups, all went with the word of the landowner that whatever is fair, okay, I will pay you. Whatever is right, I will pay you is what is basically what he said. So I think it's important um, that we trust in God's goodness because this is what 
this entire parable is about is the goodness of what it is that God gives to each one of us, okay? Now, remember, parables aren't for everybody. They're not for the world. They're for those that want to get the spiritual truth of, of each one of them. And God is, is so good, okay? It's not about timing. It's about what it is that, that God says, because um, the last being first and the first being last is totally spelled out right here. The goodness of God is almost um, not able to be understood because he will do what he is going to do. But as long as people are coming and doing what they should be doing relative to God, okay, that timing and so on, those type of things that we use to weigh where we should be uh, aren't even involved. Um, I do remember, <clears throat> you know, to be honest with you, Satan using a backdoor bargain uh, for Katie and I, and especially for me, because I um, I recall uh, when we lived up on Camino Island that we had invested in several homes, and all of the homes were waterfront homes. And uh, we rented them out, and... Um, Things looked really great. The market was fantastic, um, and everything everything was going real well. And finally, uh, a piece of property came available with a with a small cabin on it for um, on on no bank waterfront. And we had, had we had high bank waterfront where we were living. And I told Kate, "We got to get this." And so I called up our our. Uh, financer and I said you know you got to get us a get us a loan I got to we got to get into this house and uh, he says okay and he went right to work on on doing that and it was a it was a pretty costly house for the fact that even so Katie and I were both working and I had a little bit of a pension on top of that um, we had been we had invested in so many homes that all were waterfront that uh, we were getting pretty tight to maxing ourselves out. And so he started working on it to get us a loan. And I decided that I was going to um, talk it over with Kate one more time. Uh, we still could get out of this deal. Even so we made the offer and they accepted it. Uh, we still could get out of it. And um, she said, boy, I'm just not feeling comfortable with it. And I said, I'm starting to wonder too whether we should follow through on this. So I, I decided, you know what? We basically have bought the house and we've got finances that should go through, even so it's gonna be tight. But I decided, you know what? I'm gonna take my camera and I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna take some pictures and there's a good chance we're gonna put this house on the market because it's really, we were really starting to feel a pinch. And I went down there and I started taking pictures of this, uh, this cabin that we had right on this no bank waterfront. And all of a sudden I started, I got to the front where the water was and sitting on our bulkhead was an eagle. And you guys all know how much I love eagles and how much they run in line with a God and God's word and the representation. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I got my camera and I started taking pictures of the eagle and I kept walking closer and closer. And then he took off and he opened up those huge wings and I got a few pictures of that. And immediately I put my camera away. I got in my car, I went back up the hill where we had our high bank waterfront. And I said to Kate, you know what? I think God has spoken to me that we're supposed to keep that house. And, you know, it was kind of a backdoor bargain that the enemy used because that house ended up being um, the downfall of us financially at that time. Um, 2008 hit, the market just dropped out. All those investment homes um, went south. 
this one now was charging us an arm and a leg and um, and we basically had to get rid of it and and so in some respects it was a little bit of a bargain I kept thinking okay because I love Eagles Eagle was there you know did did I pray about that not not much did I pray whether that was a sign from God because I love Eagles that we're supposed to keep the house no did I move emotionally on it yes and so I think that that's a that's one of those things that that we've got to be really careful of because uh, <clears throat> we can be backdoored many times by the enemy if we're not solid in what it is that God wants. And the only way we're going to know that is to ask God and then listen for his answer instead of moving emotionally. And that's exactly what we did. Um, so since then, I've learned to, to move by faith and by hope in what the future is. And because, you know, if I go back in my life and I say, you know, if God would have showed me that I'm going to have a beautiful wife and two beautiful daughters and at this point, three wonderful grandsons, you know, and he would have had Hall of Fame this and Hall of Fame that. If he just showed me all of that and I would have said, oh, OK, God, I'm going to move forward on, on what I'm going to do. That would not have been walking in faith. That would have been walking in sight. And so I have to be very careful to make sure that I'm lining everything up based on my faith in his word and my trust in what he says and not my emotion in what it is that I would like, because that is all moving in sight. And so um, as we get into these perilous times, it's important that we move in the fact of how God sees things. What is his plan? And how do we move forward within that plan? And uh, because it's much bigger than the little nickel dime things that we face every single day. Um, so God is good. And um, and I always want to be good. But, um, you know, I remember a time when Sarah uh, and many of you know, Sarah uh, now has a little baby Joel married to Brian. Um, you know, when she was five years old, we took her to Disneyland. And when we took her to Disneyland, we took her there in the summer. And the first day we were there, it was unbelievable how many lines there were to go on these rides. And I thought, oh, this is going to make the difference in, in Sarah's life, you know. And so dad, being dad, he had a plan. And his plan was what we'll do tomorrow is we won't have to wait in these lines some of these rides we can't even go on today because the lines are so long and you're only five years old. Kate, she, Molly, uh, Sarah gets tired. And so my plan was that we would take it easy during the day and we'll go at about dinner time to start with. And so when people are eating dinner, there won't be as many lines and um, and we'll we'll be able to, to take those those uh, rides into the evening uh, when many of the kids are back at their motel catching up and seemed like a good plan. And guess what? Part of the plan worked. Stan's plan, of course. Part of the plan worked because there were no lines or very short lines. And so we could go on Dumbo. We could have gone on every single ride that was there. You know, it's a small world and you name it. Uh, very short lines, if any lines at all. The only problem is that after two rides, Sarah fell asleep. She was tired. And I realized that this is amazing. I had a plan that I thought was going to be so good for my daughter. And what ended up happening is she fell asleep through it. So I meant good through the whole thing. I did mean good. But my plan is not one um that did anything but disappoint uh, Sarah and Katie even at that time. And so one thing we know is that God's plans never disappoint us. As long as we're seeing the, the spiritual and the supernatural truths behind what goes on, um, he never does that. So we need to um, slow down to see God's goodness through everything. He's good. And 
man is always going to come up short. I, I come up short all the time. And I guess the, the thing that, that I love and the thing that I've learned is that the way that you see God affects the way you receive his blessings. So it's so important to see God for who he is. He wants the very, very best for each one of us. The devil always brings doubt and, um, you know, unsettledness. But um, picture God as good, because that's what the parable is, is telling us, that God really is good. He takes, he took a those workers and ended up paying them a full day's wage. And um, let's be big hearted with everything we do. You know, be generous. Uh, trust in him. I know that I grew up with, uh, <clears throat> with a dad who went around the house and turned off every light in the house whenever we weren't in the room. And to this day, he still does that at 97 years old. But I found out, I realized that, wow, I kind of do that too. And, um, and Kate will say, hey, I was just going to get back into that refrigerator. You didn't need to close that refrigerator door. Or I was going back into the closet. Why did you turn off the closet light? You know, and, and so there's different, different things that come up that I realize, wow, I do some of the same, same type of things. And, um, you know, and I don't know that this has ever happened, but I know that to me, but it, it has happened before, you know, you'll take your family out for maybe a dinner and it's really nice. And then it'll come to dessert time. And, you know, uh, uh, one of the children will say, man, that cake looks good. And boy, the a la mode on top of it really looks good. You know, and the dad may say, wait a minute, you know, the cake's good enough for you. You know, no a la mode. You don't need the a la mode. It's 50 cents more, you know. And, um, you know, it goes on, blah, blah, blah. Money doesn't grow on trees, you know. And you have to wonder, where did it, where did that saying ever come from? Well, it came from his dad, who got it from his dad, who got it from his dad, that money doesn't grow on trees. But we really need to break that curse because um, because we are children of God. And, uh, and, and we don't, you know, we don't need to use, do anything, but not be relationship dividers, okay, because of money, okay? Um, we are to use money uh, and love people and not love money and use people. So use the money to love people in all, the, all that we do. Because, you, you know, the old saying is you can't take it with you, but many times uh, people will not use their money, and then after somebody passes away, they buy them a, a, a gold-plated casket to show how much they loved him. Let's show how much we love people by being generous and, um, and big-hearted right now, you know, because I heard about a guy who prayed to God once and said, God, I, I'm not a, my ends aren't meeting right here. I just need a little bit more money. And, um, and God said, well, you have the money. He says, no, I don't have the money. He says, it's right there in your savings account. And the man said, no, 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 wait a minute. That's for, I'm saving that for a rainy day. And he says, well, guess what? If you save it for a rainy day, you're going to have a rainy day. We need to be faith people that don't always be, always be saving for some rainy day to happen. Because if you're saving for a rainy day, you're probably going to get a rainy day. But God has told us that he will multiply uh, all of the things that we do for the sake of Jesus with our money, with our time, and with our effort, as I said earlier. So let's break off that small spirit that oftentimes rules our lives. And I know he's had to break it off of me. And, um, and I just encourage you to allow God to, to break it off. You know, God is good all the time. And he he's all he's he makes it easy for us with all the promises that he has. And um, look at how easy when when he says this, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't get much easier than that. Okay? 
call on the name of the Lord. Now, God will work through us once we make that call, okay, and show us, you know, the depth of what that means and what we have done. But it's real important for us to to move in that because he cares for everything. He even cares for the small things in our life. I had little Oren on my lap to start this today. But, you know, the reason I brought him in, just like Jet, um, at a very young age, in fact, he was two years old. Okay, it only happened a month ago. But he was in with his Mimi, uh, you know her as Katie, and um, was reading her a book uh, about Jesus. And he watches super books all the time with all of the messages about Jesus and Moses and, and so on. And finally, one day, Mimi says, you know, someday you're going to accept uh, Jesus into your heart. And he stood up at two years old and he said, Mimi, I want to do it right now. And so he accepted Jesus into his heart. Some people would say, well, he's too young to know what he's doing. It doesn't say that. It doesn't give any age right in his word. It just says, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he says, I accept Jesus in my heart. And then he went away and Mimi said, well, you know, you want to grow in that. He says, yes, I'm going to grow in that. So, you know, it's, it's exciting to see things like that. But God cares about the little things. And when I say little things, I'm talking about a little Oren. But, you know, it's, it's all those things. We may say, well, God doesn't care that much about this or that. The truth of the matter is, if it concerns you, it concerns him. And so let the little things in your life even be uh, lifted up to him because he does care about you. And, um, you know, Katie and I love going to the ocean. And uh, when we go to the ocean, we have a particular area where we go. We've got to walk three miles out and three miles back to get to it. But there's there's an area where uh, potentially, depending on the tides and everything, that there's agates. And we love we love picking up agates. It's a kind of a it's not a competition, but it's a it's a personal competition to, to look down, see if you can find any of these little agates or sometimes big agates. But um, I know um, a week ago or so we were at the ocean and I <clears throat> I remembered, you know, I pray I'll pray for the little things. Lord, I'd like to get a couple agates today. You know, that would be that would be fun. So direct me. And uh, it's amazing. There were times when I thought, oh, um, 10 steps up there, there are some shells. And I wonder if mixed in those shells might be some agates. And I went up there and I thought, no, eh, they're not there. And then I started back to the path that we were on. And on the path, on the way back to the path, I picked up two agates that were sitting right there that I would have never got had they had I just stayed on the path that I was there. A couple times that I've, I've been out in the waves and as the tide's going out, you have oftentimes the agates can come in and uh, off of the off of the tide and off the waves. And uh, one time the wave broke a little bit heavier than it had. And I was I was jogging up to get away from it. So my feet didn't get wet. And after jogging away from the tide and getting back into a walking lane, there was an agate right there. So I guess the point is that I used to think, oh man, should I be praying to God about the fact that I love finding agates? And I now realize, no, I, yes, I mean, <laughs> I should pray. I pray for, just pray for everything. Um, it's amazing in our church, how many people have been healed how many people have got through some really tough times because they personally prayed and they had a body of believers praying for them. So let's make sure that we are aware that God is a good God. And if, if it concerns you in any way, shape or form, it concerns him. And um, and so even the small things, you know, today I want to. I want to finish because we went through the parable of the laborers uh, in the vineyard. And, um, and I just want to read to you what one commentary said. Okay. And it said this, this has to do with the parable that I went through. 
in the context of Matthew, the workers with the contract contract represented Israel. They had the promises and the covenants. Those without an agreement represented the Gentiles, who would be made equal with the Jewish people when salvation became available to all through faith in Jesus Christ. So at one time, as Gentiles, we were the last. But now, all of us have the availability of becoming first, meaning first in the kingdom, because of the free gift of what Jesus paid the price for and finished the work on the cross for each one of us. We don't need to make any deals. No deals, because he's the real deal. And I just want to leave you today uh, with that word of encouragement. I'm excited for the next time we have an opportunity to meet because I am going to talk about the excitement and the great hope of that rapture uh, that God speaks to. Uh, not by the word rapture, but speaks to in his word about us reuniting with him. God bless you all. Happy New Year. And we'll look forward to seeing you at, at church soon, hopefully. I love you all. And God bless you. Father, we thank you for today. We just ask, Lord, that you will continue uh, to guide each person. Lord, may they take this parable and may they use it in their own life to realize that they've been made first. Uh, as, as Gentiles, they become uh, first because of the availability of Jesus Christ as their Savior. So, Lord, we just pray that we walk that out. Thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us shines, whether we know it or not. And everywhere we go, we make an impact with the people that we are around. Thank you, Lord, that we carry the, the restrainer right now that, is keep, that keeps this world going the way that, that it is, Lord. And we thank you that uh, once we're taken out of here, Lord, that that's when uh, the catastrophe of the tribulation will happen. And so, Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we pray over each believer today, Lord, that they will continue to increase in their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. See you soon.